This is lesson number 24 on the case for biblical Christianity. Please recall by way of review that in the previous lesson I emphasized several very important matters regarding the Word of God. Remember that the course is divided into four major areas, God, God's work, God's Word, and God's Son. So we ended the third area last in the, in the previous lesson where I emphasized a number of things about God's Word. And there's a story I want to relate, a true story that it happened in my own experience with a skeptic friend of mine many, many years ago. In fact, I think this was the last time that I ever saw him after he had said some things against the Bible and spoke about it in a way that would discredit it, I said, well, about 40 men wrote the Bible. And I suggest that before you attack the Bible or say things against it, that you and 39 other scholars like yourself he was on the staff of a college, now university. And I said, you can pick these 39 others from 39 other colleges and universities and just pick whomever you wish. And you 40 men get together and write a book. Just don't quote from the Bible or draw any wisdom from it but write a book and don't present it as a book as good as the Bible because that won't be saying anything for it if you're putting the Bible down. But you present a book that you 40 men write that is better than the Bible. The man did not answer. He just kind of dropped his head and walked away, never said a word. What could he say? The Bible is the Word of God. Now as we enter into the fourth area of our course, God's Son, I'll relate another story about this skeptic friend on that same day just before he encountered my proposal about writing a better book than the Bible. He said that Jesus was a good man, but not the Son of God. I asked him how he knew that he was a good man. He said, well, Matthew said he was. Now, this skeptic friend of mine was a historian. He wrote a history on the state of Kentucky, an outstanding scholar, Ph.D. And I had a lot of respect for him for many reasons. He came to hear me preach some. But uh, he said that Jesus was a good man, but not the Son of God. And I asked him, how do you know he was a good man? He said, well, Matthew said he was. And I said, then you accept Matthew as a historian? Oh, yes, indeed, he said. I said, by what rules or reason do you conclude that you can accept what you want from Matthew and reject the other? How do you rule out historically where Jesus presents himself and teaches that he was God's son? And, of course, he had no reply to that. And I said, I want to tell you what a skeptic's definition of a good man is. He said, what do you mean? I said, according to your own statement, Jesus was a good man, but not the Son of God. That means that Jesus, who said he was the Son of God and taught that he came down from the Father, came into this world and was leaving the world and going back to the Father, like John 16, 28 says, that he said all of these things about himself as being the Son of God. And yet, according to you, he was telling something that wasn't so. 
So a skeptic's definition, your definition as a skeptic of a good man is a man who tells things about himself that are not true. Because if Jesus told things about himself that were not true, he wasn't even a good man because good men do not tell things that are not true. Jesus, therefore, was all that he claimed to be or he was not even a good man. And in a previous lesson, we, I presented a, a statement from Will Durant, the great American author and historian, and it's appropriate that we repeat it here in this connection for emphasis sake, and it deals directly with what I'm talking about. Jesus was not the invention of four writers named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus was a real person. He was not only a human being, he was also a divine being, and this is the mystery of the Incarnation. And on this very subject, Will Durant said that a few simple men should in one generation have invented so appealing a personality, so lofty an ethic, and so inspiring a vision of human brotherhood would be a miracle far more incredible than any recorded in the Gospels. And with Dr. Durant, I wholeheartedly agree. In other words, it's easier to believe what the New Testament says about Jesus when you examine all other views regarding him. It's easier to believe the view that is presented of Jesus in the New Testament than it is to believe any other view. And if you doubt that, you just need to examine the other views and see the problems that you will encounter in trying to believe them. There's a very important question then that we can raise here. Dr. C.S. Farber, in a book, Difficulties of Infidelity, on pages 96 through 201, wrote considerably on this particular question. And I have drawn from his writings a few statements and put in some of my own observations and conclusions on this very important matter. The question is, <clears throat> was Jesus Christ of Nazareth an imposter and a designing opportunist? Never was there a period in history that offered a more tempting opportunity to a designing opportunist than when Jesus of Nazareth was born in the land of Palestine. There are reasons for saying this. The Jews were under Roman bondage. They endured an occupational military force that lived in their land, occupying their land. And they were very, very impatient with Rome, naturally. They were eager to cast off the yoke of bondage. They expected a mysterious personage as a mighty deliverer, and we refer to him as the Messiah. Unfortunately, Satan had so warped the concept in the mind of the average Jewish person of what the Messiah was supposed to be, that when he actually came, they didn't recognize him as the Messiah. And even the disciples, according to Luke chapter 24, there were two disciples, remember, on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Cleopas was one of them, and they met Jesus after he was raised from the dead and they didn't realize who he was. And they were telling then, they began to tell Jesus, they were telling him about what had happened to Jesus of Nazareth. The title of one of my books is When Christ Was Preached to Christ. 
a book of sermon outlines. And one of the 52 sermons in it is based on this chapter, and the outline is taken from the text of what these men preached to Jesus of Nazareth, not knowing it was he. But in what they said to him, remember that they said, we had hoped that it was he who would redeem Israel. That is, that would set Israel free and take off this yoke of bondage, the Roman yoke of bondage. So they were expecting this. And uh, even the disciples expected it. Then uh, this was a great opportunity for Jesus to display himself as such a redeemer. But that was not the kind of redeemer that he came to be. And note, secondly, the question, how would a designing opportunist have acted in such a situation? The Jews expected a Messiah who would be a great warlike prince, not a prince of peace who would liberate them from Rome. And we could note that from Luke chapter 17 when they finally demanded of Jesus that he do what he was talking about. And Luke 17, 20 and 21, notice what Dr. Luke wrote for us. And when he, meaning Jesus, was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he had been talking about the kingdom of God coming, and they perceived of it uh, as referring to an earthly kingdom. Even the apostles thought this at first. And so they demanded that he tell them when this kingdom was coming in their impatience. Now, had he been a, divine, uh, a rather a designing opportunist, it would certainly have been the opportune time for him to have said, well, we're just about ready to establish that kingdom. But instead he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You see, they were expecting drums beating, bugles blowing, troops marching, flags flying, and they were saying, Where are your generals? Where is your army? Where are your bands, your military music, your flags, your banners? We want to see something. And Jesus said, that's not the way it's going to be. My kingdom is not coming with observation. Now, there's another sense, of course, in which the kingdom of God did come with observation, but not that kind of observation, the kind that these men were, to, were asking about. And when the kingdom actually did come, which is the church, about which we read in the Bible, according to Acts chapter 2, the kingdom did come with observation. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, and there were visible signs that appeared like as of fire, tongues that sat upon these apostles. And there was a great noise. That certainly was observable. And it came from heaven when the kingdom of God actually came on the day of Pentecost. But that's not the kind of observation these Jews were demanding. They were demanding that they, that he bring forth his army, his military band, his banners, his flags, his marching troops. It's time, if you're going to talk about the kingdom, it's time you're doing something about it. And so he said, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. In other words, you won't be able to say, oh, I hear the bands playing. Look, over there, there comes the soldiers marching. I see the banners flying. Nothing like that, because the kingdom of God is within us. Now, that does not negate the fact that the New Testament teaches that we are within the kingdom. And yet, at the same time, the kingdom is within us in its influences, its holy benefits and blessings, and the subjection which we render unto our Savior Jesus Christ in our hearts means that the kingdom of God is in us. So the Jews thought the Messiah would enter would uh, enter into their world and confer on them extraordinary prosperity and exalt their nation as head of all nations. Why did Jesus 
not then present himself as such. Instead of presenting himself as such, he said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20, Luke chapter 9 and verse 58. Why did Jesus not call on the Jews to rise up against Rome under a banner of a heaven-sent deliverer? Well, he wasn't a designing opportunist. He wasn't an imposter. He came to do his Father's will. Instead of doing what they wanted him to do, that is, raise an army and run the Roman troops out of the land of Palestine. Instead, he said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. That is the king under whose reign we live in the church that he purchased with his own precious blood. Why did Jesus not flatter the Pharisees for their piety. Instead of flattering them or speaking in such terminology to praise them and to exalt them, as you read in Matthew chapter 23, he spoke out many woes against them for their hypocrisy and their deceitfulness and their sinfulness. You could call that 23rd chapter the atomic chapter in a way. It's so powerful against the abuses that were so rampant in the land among the Jewish people and their sinfulness. And so he spoke out against it. And then we could raise the question in concluding this part on this question, why was or was Jesus an imposter? Was he a designing opportunist? We can conclude this with the question, why did Jesus not entice the Sadducees with offers of temporal abundance. He did not appeal to the desires of any of the Jewish sects. He came from God to bring God's case and cause before them and to instill in their hearts the true meaning of serving God. And so that is good evidence that he is all that he claims to be. Then another one that we don't want to note is a list, and I do not know the author's name, but it's a list of statements where Christ is compared. Plato was a great thinker and learned in his age, but his teaching did not stand the test of time. In big things and in little things, time and human experience have shown that Plato erred. Marcus Aurelius touched the reflective mind of the world, but he was as cold and austere as brown marble. The doctrine of Confucius gave a great nation moral and mental dry rot. The teachings of Buddha resulted in mental and moral chaos that makes India derelict. Now remember, this list was written, or maybe I didn't mention, no one seems to know who wrote it, but it was written many decades ago, I think in the early part of this century. Number five, Mohammed offered a system of ethics which was adopted by millions of people. Now their children live in deserts where once there were cities. And of course at this time he was referring to certain segments of their children. Along dry rivers where once there was moisture and in the shadows of gray barren hills where once there was greenness. Thomas Aquinas, the great angelic doctor as some called him, was a profound philosopher but parts of his system have been abandoned. Francis of Assisi, a profound and Christ-like man in his saintliness, but 
in some things he acted like a child. Thomas Akempis, in his imitation of Christ, is a thing of rare beauty and sympathy, but it is, as its name indicates, only an imitation. Lord Bacon, writing on chemistry and medicine under the glasses of the man working in a 20th century laboratory, is pureal. In case you're not acquainted with the word pureal, it's from the Latin word puer that means boy. It's childish, in other words, or boyish. In the third place, we want to note the incomparable Christ. The university professor that called on his students to write a list of 12 of the greatest people did a great service to those students when he told them that they should not have put Christ on that list because he said Christ does not belong on a list with any others. He stands alone. He is incomparable. He is unique. No one else like Him. And there are some marks of this incomparable Christ that somebody listed. In His infancy, He scared a jealous king so much that the king tried to kill Him. In his boyhood, Jesus puzzled the highest educators or doctors, teachers. In his manhood, he walked on water and hushed the sea to sleep. He spoke to the dead and they responded whenever he wanted to. He healed multitudes without medicine and made no charge. He never wrote a book, but all the libraries could not hold the books that could be written about him. I think of Abraham Lincoln, something I read about him a number of years ago when somebody said that there had been more books written about Abraham Lincoln than any other person except Jesus of Nazareth. At that time, about 30 years ago, in this particular book, the man said there had been a book written about Lincoln, one per day on the average, since the days of the Civil War. That's a lot of books, isn't it? And that may be true, but we can't compare Christ with Lincoln or Lincoln with Christ. It is true they both began in very humble circumstances. You might say each was born in a barn, but Lincoln was just a man, a good man, an outstanding man, but he was not like Christ. Then the list goes on and says, Christ never wrote a song, but he furnished the theme for more songs than all other songs or all other songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but he has more students than all colleges put together. He died, but he lives. Another list I want to call to your attention that somebody gave, and I do not know the author of it, what Jesus gave. He gave his mother to John. He gave his body to Joseph of Arimathea. He gave his clothes to the soldiers. He gave his peace to his disciples, like he said in John 14, 27. He gave his supper to those in his kingdom or his church, according to Luke chapter 22. He gave himself as an example, as a servant, and as a sinless person for everyone to follow. He gave his gospel to the whole world and he gave his presence to all who follow him. 
There's an important observation I should like to make here regarding this list. As I said, I really don't know who wrote the list. I think it's a good list, and it's certainly a good outline for a great lesson, just that alone, a sermon on what Christ gave. But whoever wrote it left out the most important matter of all, and that is, as we read in Titus chapter 2, 13 through 15, where Paul told Titus that he was to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. There's the main gift. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Paul stated this in another way in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 when he said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Indeed, our Savior was qualified more than anyone else to say, as Paul said he said, as he spoke to the elders of the church in Ephesus according to Acts chapter 20, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He was always giving, hardly ever receiving anything except insults and injury and finally death itself. But he gave himself. We want to note also under the heading, This Jesus, three areas for our consideration as we think about this man of Galilee. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 32, in the midst of the great sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and I say great sermon because it is indeed a great sermon. In a way, it is the hub of the entire Bible because of so many basic matters in the second chapter of the book of Acts. And that includes this great sermon, which is so basic to Christianity. And this sermon is indeed a masterpiece presented by one who came forth from a boat where he had been a fisherman who had not studied homiletics or preparation and delivery of sermons in any kind of a college, but he came out and on the day of Pentecost stood up and preached a sermon that is absolutely marvelous and overwhelming. The only way that we can sensibly answer the question, how did he do this, is that as the text says, he was speaking as the Holy Spirit gave him direction. And so God was speaking all of this through the Apostle Peter as an inspired man. And in verse 32, as he was preaching on Jesus, he said, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Underscore that statement. This Jesus. Just what Jesus are we considering here? The inspired men preached this Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I was determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, as I have pointed out many, many times in a series of sermons on what it means to preach Christ and him crucified, that does not mean that in preaching Christ and him crucified we just talk about Christ as a person. And we learn that from studying the scriptures. But we do include talking about him as a person. 
And indeed, Jesus must be preached as the kind of person that he is presented to be in the New Testament scriptures and even in the prophecies of the Old Testament. This Jesus was born in a barn. He came from God into this world, John 16, 28. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go unto the Father, he said. And the mystery of the Incarnation is just as great as ever. In all of our scientific and technological advances and knowledge, we're not any more able today to explain the Incarnation of Christ than people were at the time it occurred, because it's a mystery. And God has not revealed all the details of this fantastic event. And so we accept it by faith. But our faith is based on good evidence. If you try to explain him some other way, how he got into this world, you'll run into difficulties that you cannot get around. Jesus was all that he claimed to be. He was born of a virgin in a barn, born in a stable. His first resting place was the feeding trough of cattle. And had cynics been there, like some I have known, looking in on that blessed holy scene, they might have said cynically and contemptuously, that in that manger is God? How could God be in a baby in a barn? Well, like I said, it's a matter of faith, and faith is well-founded and well-grounded. But that is a true description of the one that came to redeem us. This Jesus is the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies. And one of them, remember, is in Isaiah chapter 53, where we are told that he would come up as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. It seems that this suggests in Isaiah's proleptic prophecy, that means speaking of it as though it had already come, or that he was already, already had already experienced these things, but a tender plant suggests how fragile he was as the world looked upon things or as a root out of a, out of a dry ground. What could a root in a dry ground ever accomplish? It looked hopeless. I believe that's what Isaiah was prophesying. What seemed to be hopeless was the world's only real hope. And so he, this one that would be a tender plant and a root out of a dry ground seemed to have a struggle as a tender plant or a root in a dry ground would have a struggle. He came of a fallen family. His entry into the world in no way agrees with the Jewish conception and expectations of the Messiah. The Jews knew the Messiah would be David's descendant of David's family. But at the time that Jesus was born, the house of David was in a fallen state. It was in ruins. I wish I could take the time, but I can't here, to show you something from Acts chapter 15 on that but we'll not take the time here about the fallen family or house of David. The Jews expected him to be great as they looked upon greatness, to have uh, nobility and pomp and circumstance and color and excitement and glamour. But Jesus was born in a barn. And he grew up in a despised city, the city of Nazareth, and grew up 
under the tutelage not only of his mother, Mary, who was a virgin when she conceived and when she brought forth this son. He also was under Mary's husband, Joseph, who was a carpenter. And Mark chapter 6 tells us that Jesus was a carpenter, worked in a carpenter's shop, no doubt had scratches and cuts on his hands and calluses and corns, a working young man. He was not trained in the learning that was held in the high esteem of the Jews. Like in John chapter 17, we rather John chapter 7, the Jews marveled concerning him, this young man. How does this man know letters? having never learned. Now, if you read the context and the circumstances, you'll know that they were not saying he'd never learned anything, but he hadn't learned in the sense of going to the places of higher instruction or higher learning. As we might put it, he didn't have, the, have degrees from the best institutions, but he was so learned. They were astonished. And that's when Jesus in the next verse explained my doctrine or my teaching is not mine, but his that sent me. Jesus always credited the, the Father with what he taught, saying he didn't speak anything but what the Father gave him. So they wondered and marveled at this, how he could know so much, and that was the reason. He was speaking what the Father gave him. Jesus of Nazareth made no pretense to be the kind of deliverer that the Jews expected and desired. And so he was a scandal or a stumbling block to them, as Paul explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23. He had no military power, no officers, no honors to bestow upon military men in military circles. He made no attempt to effect a political revolution as had others, or we could say he made no attempt to do this even though the government needed to be changed, and it was bad. He did not even attempt to settle family disputes and troubles except to tell them great principles that would govern their conduct and their thoughts and their actions toward each other as in Luke chapter 13, remember when the man came to him and said, Speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus didn't say, Well, now you've come to the right one. I'm the man you need to ask about this or to talk to about this because I can settle this. Instead, he said, Beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the, th the abundance of the things which he possesses. How marvelous it would be if all of us could learn this lesson well and live by it. How different the world would be. He taught truths that were against the prejudices of his hearers. As we read, for example, in Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 23. And when they tried to make him king, the Bible tells us in John chapter 6 and verse 15, that he refused to become their king. There are some who say, known as premillennialists, that Jesus came to be king and set up his kingdom on earth, and the Jews wouldn't let him. But the Bible says the Jews tried to make him be their king, and he wouldn't be that kind of king just the opposite of the premillennial heresy. So then our Savior made his position known and made it clear that his aims and purposes were too broad and universal for their liking. He often rebuked the Jews and promised the kingdom would be for those afar off, as in Matthew chapter 8, meaning the Gentiles. And he told a number of stories to illustrate this, like the Good Samaritan story and so on. 
He talked of a kingdom which even his apostles were slow to appreciate because it was contrary to what they expected also. And in Matthew 18 and Luke 22, Mark 9, Matthew 20, a number of passages, we read about how these apostles fussed among themselves and were disputing with each other over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus taught them that they misunderstood, that that is not the kind of kingdom he was going to establish. So then, we want to observe, first of all, that this Jesus was unattractive to man in the senses which we've noted here. And in the second place, this Jesus had traits that made him attractive to some. Let's look at them briefly. His patient dignity in moments of trial, his suffering, his provocation that he endured. As Isaiah 53 says in that beautiful prophecy we referred to a while ago, that he was wounded for our transgression. He was mistreated and misused and abused for us. He bore our sins in his own body. So he was led, as Isaiah said, like a lamb to the slaughter. And that's what Peter refers to in 1 Peter chapter 2, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. His gentleness is attractive. His gentleness toward and his interest in the young. Children. He gave children attention. The crippled, the afflicted, the forsaken, the accused, the lonely, the broken-hearted, the troubled, the unworthy. That was certainly a trait that made him attractive. His greatness toward his enemies. He said as he was dying, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Just think about this. They were crucifying him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is indicated, as the scholars point out, and I remember doing a paper on the imperfect tense in a foreign language conference once in the University of Kentucky, and my mind goes back to that time on the imperfect tense in Greek. In fact, I think I used this verse as an illustration of how the imperfect tense means that action was going on in the past. It doesn't tell you when it began nor when it ended. It was just going on. And the idea here is, according to the imperfect tense verb, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, means that he kept on saying. He was pleading out of the mercy and compassion of his great heart that they would be forgiven. That even the Roman soldiers who wounded him, who drove the spikes into his mortal form, and those who had misused and abused him so severely even among the Jews, he was praying for all that had mistreated him as he was dying. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do certainly a great attractive trait or a trait that would cause us to be attracted to him. His power over death and the grave certainly is attractive. He raised some from the dead and he was raised by the Father. This Jesus, as the text says in Acts 2.32, hath God raised 
whereof we all are witnesses. So then, there are certainly many attractive traits. And finally, there's one that we ought to remember, his power over the arch fiend of mankind, the devil himself, that he was able to resist the temptation that was meted out to him by Satan himself. And he did it with Scripture. Each time he said, Satan, it is written. And he quoted Scripture. He doted on the Holy Scriptures. That's certainly an attractive trait. Even though the Bible says in those same verses, those same texts, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, that Jesus was filled with the Spirit. And indeed he was, as we are not filled. Not in the sense that he was. But even though he was filled with the Spirit, he didn't say, now Satan, you're wasting your time on me. Have you forgot that I'm filled with the Spirit? Instead of that, he quoted Scripture. This all teaches me that the closer we are to the Holy Spirit, the more we quote the Scriptures. That our Savior displayed this wonderful trait to say that if we're going to claim relation with the Holy Spirit, then we ought to hold up the Holy Scriptures just as Jesus did. Finally, there is a third area which we need to consider on this, how this Jesus was different. This Jesus was not a philosopher, as men count philosophers. He did not talk like a book. This Jesus hardly spoke of money and riches, except to warn of the dangers thereof. This Jesus answered his critics, and did not have to hesitate. He never showed frustration. He never said, now I'll have to think about that. I'll go to the library. I'll consult the dictionary. I'll consult the, consult the advisors or the counselors or, or an encyclopedia. I'll get back with you. He was never frustrated. He never postponed what he needed to say in response to those who interrogated him or accosted him. He was different. This Jesus was different in that he was not excited over announcing new truths and great lessons and principles that he taught. He remained balanced and completely poised. Many years ago I read in the Reader's Digest about Thomas Edison, and I have a great admiration for Thomas Edison, but the more you read about great men, you realize that they were just men. As great as Thomas Edison was, and as much as he continues to bless us, even though he's dead with his inventions, the story is said that he was a man that would get almost beside himself if he was concentrating on some thing he was about to discover. That on the evening he got married, at 8 o'clock, he told his bride, I'll be back. I must go to the laboratory. He had his mind on the laboratory, some experiment. At midnight, his best man came and tapped him on the shoulder and said, Tom, your bride is waiting. Now, I find that hard to believe, but it was a story published in the Reader's Digest. Another story was that he was so beside himself in his work, he noticed that his cigars were missing. He smoked very strong cigars, and he discovered his employees were getting them. So he had his company to make up some freakish cigars out of horsehair and glue, and they were gone. Or he thought they had, didn't come, rather. He kept noticing they didn't come. He wrote the company or called the company and said, I didn't get those cigars. And they gave evidence and proof that he got them, and he realized he had smoked them himself. Well, he was just a man, like the rest of us, in some ways, a genius in many ways. But Jesus never was unbalanced. He never lost his poise. 
his composure. He was different. This Jesus had perfect control of the elements because he made them. He could say to the winds and storms of the sea, Peace, be still. Matthew 8, 26 says, He arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. This Jesus claimed to be above sin. And we read in the New Testament of several, like Pilate, who said, I find no fault in him. Like Judas even, I have betrayed the innocent blood, Judas said. That would have been a great opportunity for Judas to have said, and I know some things about him. I was with him closely associated. He wasn't so hot himself all the time. But instead of that, he said he's innocent. I'm the guilty one. And even the centurion, as he had watched Jesus die on Calvary's cross, said, Surely this was the Son of God. Jesus was different. He expressed no remorse for sin when he was dying. We've noted already that he prayed for the forgiveness of the sins of others. I greatly admired G.C. Brewer, a great gospel preacher, man who baptized my mother, one of the greatest orators of our times, died 30-some-odd years ago. I read many of his writings. Perhaps the last thing he ever wrote, I read it. He was dying with cancer. And he said, Brethren, I want you to pray for me. Pray two things. Here's a man so good and so saintly, and yet he had a consciousness of sin. And that's the way it is with all of us. So I said, I want you to pray that I'll not suffer long in this state and that God will forgive me of all my sins. But no indication that Jesus ever expressed any remorse for sin. He was different. He did not promise ease, but warned of dangers if you follow me, he said. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 10, 22. And finally, he set up a very unusual memorial. He didn't build a great library, a great granite monument to, by which he could be remembered. He gave some humble men some bread and fruit of the vine and said, when you eat this and drink this, Remember me. Skeptics and cynics might have said, Ah, some memorial, he won't be remembered long. But he's still remembered, isn't he? Just last Lord's Day, I remembered him in this way at the Lord's table. And this Jesus can save us from our sins. Thank you very much.